All right, guys, welcome to week 13 College Board Review Help video number one. Let f be a differentiable function such that f of 2 equals 1, f of 3 equals 4, f prime of 2 equals 5, and f prime of 3 equals 6. The function g is differentiable, and g is the inverse of f. As you can see, it says g equals f inverse of x. The question ask, is asking us, what is g prime of 1? All right, well, we know that g of x is equal to the inverse of f of x, and therefore g prime of x would be equal to the derivative of the inverse of f. And there's a formula for this that we learned a little while back, and that formula is 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. Now we want to know what's g prime of 1, so I'm going to do g prime of 1. Well, that would be the same thing as f inverse prime of 1, which is 1 over all of this. Okay? So that's a good start. Now we have some work to do. The, the first thing we need to do to simplify this is we need to figure out what is f inverse of 1. Well, I don't know what that is at the moment, so I'm going to put a question mark here. But what I do know is that if f inverse of 1 equals question mark, then f of question mark equals 1. That's how inverses work. So I actually have something up here that looks a lot like that. I've got f of something equals 1 there. And that means that that something must be 2. So if that is 2, then that means this is 2, which means this part down here is 2, and I've got 1 over f prime of 2. And f prime of 2 also happens to be a given piece of information. So now I'm going to find out what that is, and according to the information up there, it's 5. And there's my final answer. Okay, so we have to know the formula, and we also need to know this little fact about inverses here in order to make that work. Let's go ahead and move on to our second question here. Number two, the table below gives the values of the differentiable functions f and g and f prime, which is the derivative of f, at selected values of x. And once again, it's another inverse question. So g, oops, g, in, g is equal to the inverse of f of x, they want to know what's g prime of 7. Well, I know that g of x is equal to f inverse of x, and therefore I know that g prime of x is equal to f inverse prime of x. And I have a formula for that, once again, which is 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. And therefore, if I want to find g prime of 7, I just plug 7 into dx to this entire expression here. Alright, once again we got to start by finding out what this is. So f inverse of 7 is equal to something that I don't know yet, but if f inverse of 7 is equal to something that I don't know yet, then that's something that I don't know if I plug it into f, I get 7. So what I want to do is I want to find out what value of x gives me an f value of 7. Well, here's where f is equal to 7, so the x value that goes with that is 2. So once again, my question mark here must be a 2. Oops, I put it in the wrong spot on top there. So if f inverse of 7 is equal to 2, then I can replace this piece down here with 2, and I have 1 over f prime. 2. Now I'm going to go to my table, I'm going to find where x equals 2, and I'm going to go and find out what f prime is at that point, and that would be 1. So I'm left with 1 over 1, and therefore my final answer is 1. Alright, let's go ahead and move on to another one. If f of x is equal to arctangent of 4x to the third, find f prime of x. So for the next few questions, you guys are going to want to look at your 1.8 notes to 
remind yourself of the derivatives of arc trig functions. But here we go. So we have an outside function, which is arc tangent, and then we have an inside function, which is that. So the derivative of arc tangent looks like this. 1 over the inside squared plus 1. That's the derivative of arc tangent. Then we're going to multiply that by the derivative of the inside there, which is 3 times 4 is 12. You take 1 off the power squared. And then if we put these together, this piece is going to go in the numerator. So I have 12x squared on the top. And on the bottom, I can square that and get 16x to the 6th power plus 1. And that would be my final answer. So you need to go to your 1.8 notes to recall what your arc trig derivatives are. Um, but it will be a chain rule after that. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at another one. So for number four, it's another arc trig one, so I would just refer you to look at that last example again. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this one. This one has more arc trig in it. This is another way of writing arc cosine with a little negative one there instead. But this one is different than the last two because it's an implicit function as well. And what do I mean by implicit function? I mean there's y's inside of the equation also. So how do we handle this situation? Well, we go ahead and just find the, the derivative here. It says, which of the following could be used to find the slope of the line tangent to this curve? And I think all they're going to really want you guys to do here is just to find the derivative. Because if you want to find the slope of a tangent line, you start by finding a derivative. So we're going to find this derivative right here. All right, so let's begin. Now, this first one here is going to be a little bit of work, okay? So I want to find this derivative first. Well, notice it's an arc cosine, and it's a chain rule because I have an outside function as well as a inside function, right? So what is the derivative of arc cosine? The derivative of arc cosine is 1 over actually it's negative 1, over the square root of 1 minus the inside squared. Now we need to multiply that by the derivative of the inside, that's this piece here. And so that's going to be, the derivative of x squared is 2x. The derivative of that will be minus 4y, but since it's a y, we're going to give it a y prime. And the derivative of the 5 just goes away. All right, so that's that first piece. Now let's move on to the next piece. Now I want to find the derivative of 4x. That's pretty simple. That's just going to be 4. Next, I want to find the derivative of e to the y. So that's going to be, anytime you take the derivative of an e function, it's just going to stay exactly the same. But since it is a y expression, we're going to get a y prime factor there. Next, we want to find this derivative. Now, that's just a number. It's a weird-looking number, but ln of 8 is just a number. And so is this. And when you take the derivatives of numbers, they just go away. So those pieces are gone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and simplify this a little bit by taking this piece and moving it to the numerator and distributing this negative 1 into it. So if we do that, we're going to end up with negative 2x plus 4y, y prime, over the square root of 1 minus all that fun stuff. Now, these problems can go on a little bit more. Um, the, the next step, if they wanted to take it there, would be to get the terms that have the y primes on the same side. So in other words, I would want to put those together and move this 4 to the other side. But on your particular College Board assignment, they don't really care about that step. They stop here. They just want to see if you could do the implicit differentiation. Um, so that's enough. But I will say another thing I noticed is that they don't put y prime on your College Board assignment. Instead, they put dy dx. It's just another way of writing the same thing there, just so you know. Okay, so that's it. So you're going to be doing a derivative of a pretty big expression, 
and you're going to be having a chain rule. And don't forget to put y primes next to your y's. And you're also going to have some expressions that are just numerical, and those go away when you do the derivative. The rest of it, though, I think is what I showed you there. So we'll go ahead and move on to number six. So if g of x is equal to 5x minus 3 to the third power, we want to find the third derivative of this function. And that's a typo. I should have put g there. We want to find the third derivative of that function at x equals 1. So here's my function. Let's go ahead and find the first derivative. I want to find the third derivative, but let's start by finding the first. So this is going to be a chain rule. So we have the outside function here, and then we have the inside function. So the derivative of the outside is going to be moving the power to the front and taking one off the power and leaving the inside the same. Then we're going to do the derivative of the inside, which is simply 5. Now I am going to simplify this by multiplying the 5 and the 3 together. That will make the next step easy. So there's my first derivative, but now let's find the second derivative. So I want to take the derivative of this now to find my second derivative. Well, once again, I've got an inside function and I have an outside function. So the derivative of the outside is going to be 2 times 15, which is 30. And then I'm going to take 1 off the power, so now it's 1. The inside is going to stay the same. And then we need to multiply that now by the derivative of the inside, which once again is 5. And once again, I'm just going to put these two terms here together, and that ends up giving me 150 if we multiply those. 5x minus 3 to the first power. Um, last step, I want to find my third derivative. Now, in your guys' you're going to find the fourth derivative, but you're just repeating the process over and over again, so no big deal there. Um, we could do this next step in two ways. One way is you could really just distribute the 150. That might be easier for some of you. Uh, or you could just keep doing the chain rule thing. So I can multiply the 1 to the front, so that's going to be 150 still. And then we're going to take 1 off of the power, which is 0. And then we're going to multiply it by the derivative of the inside, which is 5. Now anything to the 0 power is 1. And 150 times 1 is just 150. So I have 150 times 5, which uh, here's the 25, I believe that's going to be 750, is my final answer. Now we're done. It says, what is the third derivative of x equals 1? Now if I still had an x here, I would plug in 1 for the x value. But there's no more x, so I'm done. And I'm pretty sure the same thing will happen on your guys' college board one. But if it doesn't, just plug in your 1 at the end. Okay, all right, let's go ahead and do number seven here. So once again, we have another implicit function. Um, this one is asking us to find the second derivative at a specific point. Okay, so step one is to find the first derivative. So 2x squared minus 3y cubed equals 5. I want to find the derivative of that. So that derivative is going to be 4x. That derivative is going to be 9y squared. And don't forget your y prime because it is a y term. And then finally, that's going to be 0. All right. Uh, the next thing we want to do is get this y prime here by itself. So the first thing I would do is I would just maybe um, move the 4x to the other side. And make it negative because it's like you subtract it on both sides. And then divide the 9y squared out of there. So that cancels out. And I've got y prime is equal to 4x over 9y squared. And notice I got rid of the negatives because double negatives make a positive. So that's my first derivative, but I want the second derivative. So step two is to do that again. So now I'm going to take the derivative of this thing. So the second derivative then is going to be a quotient rule. So we're going to do low d high 
minus high. Now watch out on this D low. D low is going to be 18Y, but don't forget your Y prime once again, because we're taking the derivative of a Y term. Draw a line and square below. Okay, now you could simplify this if you wanted to. Um, I guess we can go ahead and do that, why not? So if I put these together, I'm going to get 36Y squared minus uh, 4 times 18, look at that. 40 plus 32, so it's going to be 72XYY y prime. And then on the bottom, we have 81Y to the fourth. It's a little bit simpler. It's still kind of ugly looking, but oh well. Now, I want to plug in these values. I'm plugging this in for X and this in for Y, but there's a little bit of an issue. We won't, we won't be quite done after that. You'll see why. So I'm going to replace the y with negative 1. I'm going to replace the x with 2. The issue is, I don't know what y prime is. Don't, don't plug negative 1 in here, because that's what y equals, not y prime. y prime is something different. And then on the bottom, we have 81 times y to the fourth power. So. Let's go ahead and simplify this a little bit before we go any further. So we have negative 1 squared is 1, so we're, we really just have 36 now in that spot. Um, minus, putting these things together, we're going to end up with a, a positive, because there's double negatives, a positive 144y prime. And on the bottom, this is a positive 1, so 1 times 81 is just 81. All right, so... We're getting a little bit better there, but we still aren't done because I need to plug something in for this y prime. And the y prime, we, we actually know what that is. Um, y prime is this thing down here. Oops, I didn't want to erase that. It's this. So let's go ahead and put that in. So I've got 36 plus 144, and y prime is 4x over 9y squared, right? And once again, now that we've replaced the y prime with this instead, we can plug the numbers in for x and y that we did earlier. So I'm running out of space, so um, just a minute. Okay, and then after that, we're just going to simplify everything. I mean, these numbers are going to be kind of weird, um, but let's, I guess we'll go ahead and do it here. So, um, so 4 times 2 is 8, and this is 1 times 9. So basically, we end up with um, 8 over 9 there. So I'm just going to simplify that, 8 over 9. Now, I don't know if you're going to end up with a fraction here. Um, but I think what I'll do is I'll multiply these together. So 144 times 8. Need my calculator here. Hopefully your guys' won't come out quite as ugly as mine. It's big numbers. They're not going to work here. Oh, this was supposed to be a plus. Okay. And then next I'm going to multiply this by 9 over 1 to cancel that out, which I'm allowed to do so long as I multiply this by 9, and I also multiply this by 9. So let's go ahead and simplify that then. 9 times 36 is 324, plus 1152 over 81 times 9, 729. And then finally I just need to add these together. So 324 divided by 1152. I'm sorry, 324 plus 1152. And we, we should reduce, I, once again, I don't know if you guys are going to end up having something as ugly as this. I'm, I doubt it, but let me see if I can reduce this. If I reduce that, I end up with 164 over um, 81. So, anyway, you guys probably won't have as nasty of a number or an outcome as that, but the idea is there. So, basically, find your first derivative, find your second derivative, and when you do that, replace the y prime 
with what we got in the first step and then plug in your X's and Y's and from there you got it. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at number eight. Um, the table below gives selected values for a differentiable and increasing function of F and its derivative. Let g be the increasing function given by this. So once again, we have g equals something with f in it, where g of 2 equals f of 8 minus f of 2, and that all together equals 8. Um, that's kind of a weird thing, but um, if you think about it, if I plug in 2 here, right, for g, for x, I mean, 4 times 2 becomes 8, and that was just 2. So f of 8 minus f of 2, right? And then they're telling you the final answer is 8. So here's my g function. And basically g of 2 is equal to 8. We want to find what is g inverse of 8. Okay, what is g inverse? I think it's supposed to be g inverse prime of 8. All right, well, g inverse of x if I want to find its derivative, is 1 over g prime of g inverse of x. So, if I want to find out what g inverse prime of 8 is, we're going to plug in the 8. All right, so I need to find out what is g inverse prime of 8. Well, how are we going to do that? The same way we've been doing it on the other problems on this lesson for today. G inverse I don't know what g inverse of 8 is, but I do know that means that g of whatever that is is equal to 8. Well, I know what g, I know what goes here if g equals 8, because it tells me up here that g of 2 equals 8, and therefore my question mark is 2, which means that this piece is 2. And from here we just need to use the table, right? Well, actually, not quite. I take that back, because um, the table only has f in it. So how do I find g prime of 2? Well, we have to come up here to my g function, which they tell me is f of 4x minus f of x. I need to find its derivative, and after that I can plug in 2. Right? So the derivative of this is going to be a chain rule. The derivative of the outside is just f prime, and the derivative of the inside is 4. The derivative of that one is just f prime. So there's my derivative of g, and now I'm just going to plug in 2. Four times two is eight. And now we get to use our table a little bit. F prime of 8, according to my table, is 4. So this is 4 times 4, which is 16, minus F prime of 2 is 6. And then for that would be 10. So G prime of 2 is 10. And that'll be my final. So for this problem, the, the trick is in the first two steps. Um, to do this one, basically, the first step you're going to want to do is you're going to want to rewrite this as a power. And then you're going to want to distribute the x to the half in there. So, x to the half times 3x is going to be 3x to the 3 halves. Why? Because you're adding 1 and a half together, which gives you three halves. And then x to the half times negative one leaves me with minus x to the half. All right, so there's that. Now we're gonna go ahead and integrate this. So if you integrate this, you add one to the power. So if you add one to a fraction, remember it's like adding the top and the bottom together and you keep the bottom the same. And since the fraction, instead of dividing by this number, we multiply by its reciprocal. Same thing to the next one. Add 1 to the power and multiply by its reciprocal. And after you integrate, you put brackets and you put your numbers out here. 
And then you go ahead and start doing your, your math. I think I'll simplify it a little bit. So that be, that first one there, I'm going to rewrite that as 2 times 3 is 6 x to the 5 half power over 5. And the second one here, I'm going to write that as 2 x to the 3 halves power over 3. So it looks a little bit cleaner. Now we're going to go ahead and plug these numbers in. And when you do this, you want to have your setup first. And the first set of parentheses, we're plugging in 9. And the second set of parentheses, we're plugging in 4. And now we get to simplify all this. At this point, we're wishing, boy, I wish this was an FRQ, because if this was an FRQ, we would be able to stop here. But unfortunately, it's not an FRQ. Just a minute here. i got to clean up some space here to write on. Now, at this point, you guys might be wondering, how the heck do I simplify this, Mr. Dave? Well, that's a pretty calculus topic, which you haven't seen in a while, so let's review it. Something we have talked about this year is how you could rewrite that as a root, and that's really the key. Okay, now, this means I want the square root of 9, right, which is 3, and then I want 3 to the fifth power, which I believe is 243. It's a pretty chunky number. All right, we're going to do the same thing here with this guy. So I have 9 to the 3 halves is going to be the square root of 9 cubed, which is going to be 3 cubed, which is 27. I'm going to do the same thing here with these numbers. I won't show my work this time, but that first one would give you 32 there, and the second one would give you 8. Okay? And then from there, we're going to simplify it like we normally would. Um, you're going to um, you know, multiply, subtract, don't forget to um, distribute this negative into both, and so on. I'm going to stop there because I think yours is going to work out to be a lot nicer than mine. Um, so you won't run into that sort of stuff. But you will come across this kind of stuff probably. But the main thing I wanted you guys to be aware of is changing this to a half power, right? And then distributing it into here and then just integrating like normal. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at our last one here, number 10. Um, let's say this is equal to zero. Um, so there it is. So they want us to find the value of a, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take care of this side. And once that side's all done, we know it equals 0. So here we go. Let's start. If we integrate this, I get 3x squared over 2. We add 1 to the power and divide by that number. And then we put our limits there. Next, we're going to plug in the a and the 2 and subtract those values. And then we're going to simplify. So this is 3a squared over 2 minus 4 times 3 is 12 divided by 2 is uh, 6. All right. Now, all we have to do is solve for a. So the first thing I'm going to do is add 6 on both sides, which will give me 3a squared over 2 is equal to 6. Next, I would multiply both sides by 2 to cancel out that denominator there. Next, I would divide by 3. 
And finally, I would take a square root. And when you solve by taking a square root, you get a plus and a minus answer. So A could be either positive 2 or negative 2. All right. And that'll do it. So hopefully that was helpful. And we'll see you guys in class.